In July 2009, one lucky find lifted the lid on a long-lost world. We all love buried treasure. This sense of it's, it's like a fairy story. These glorious things emerging from clods of earth. It's, uh, uh, there's a sort of magic of it. An astonishing treasure trove of gold and silver hidden in a field in Staffordshire in the Midlands. You never really ever get involved in finds with sort of precious metals. This is real sort of Indiana Jones type stuff. I'm going to take you on a journey to unlock some of the mysteries of this newfound Anglo-Saxon hoard. Were they looted as a result of battles? Were they given to the Mercian king as tribute by his sub-peoples? We found them dismembered and bent. Now, were they crammed into a box to be taken away? And I'll discover just how it could help transform our understanding of one of the most fascinating periods in our history. Finds like the Staffordshire Hoard show that this was a vibrant and colourful and bright society as, as much as anything else and it helps us to think about this time in a completely different way. This is the story of the greatest find in generations. I want to take you back about 1400 years to 7th century England, to around the time when the Staffordshire Horde was hidden. The days of Roman Britain had long passed. We had entered a new era. As the Romans withdrew, bands of adventurers arrived on our shores from northern Germany and Scandinavia. The Dark Ages, the name traditionally given to the time between the Romans leaving and William the Conqueror arriving. It's a time we have only a very dim and distant knowledge of. And you can see why. This is Cat Home in Staffordshire. Now, it doesn't look like much today, but it's actually the site of one of the finest Dark Age finds ever made in the Midlands. This was an Anglo-Saxon settlement of the 7th century, a thriving community with more than 60 buildings. Anglo-Saxon Catholm would have looked very much like this. Villages where people raised livestock and grew crops. We know from archaeological evidence that average life expectancy was just 30, with people facing not just the hazards of war and feuds, but at risk from famine and epidemics. As people abandoned Roman cities, the lifestyle of this largely pagan and literate people has left historians with a challenge. The trouble is, when the Romans left, they took their stone building techniques with them, and that meant when the Anglo-Saxons built, they used wood, and their buildings have long since rotted back into the soil. What they have left are a few bits of fired ceramic. This is a weight from a weaving loom, and this is a delicate handmade urn. Basically, they didn't leave too many clues behind them. This has left historians with a major problem. How do you tell the story of this era with just a few occasional teasing glimpses into life in these long forgotten kingdoms? It's taking pieces of a puzzle, you know, you've got a thousand piece puzzle and you've only got eight of the pieces. That's the, the sense in which we've been working up until this point. The discovery of astonishing weaponry in the Staffordshire Horde shone a new light on our Anglo-Saxon past. The traditional view is that life in the Dark Ages was nasty, brutish and short and it's this idea that everyone lived in huts and um, hovels and really didn't have much quality of life. <laughs> that's why we get this term Dark Age associated with it, but that's so far from the truth. So can this find tell us more about an England divided among warring kingdoms? In the centre was Mercia, a kingdom that stretched across the Midlands and a land with a reputation for aggressive warriors. But archaeological evidence has been very thin on the ground, with few finds of any significance. We just had tantalising glimpses. Um, the, the artefacts we had covered the whole date range from the 5th to the 11th century, but just one or two items. But just a few pieces didn't really give us a full 
idea of how things were at that time. You could use documentary material and you could use um, the fact that you've got Saxon carved crosses and so on to put some flesh onto it, but the human element was somewhat lacking. In the summer of 2009, all that changed when a reluctant farmer from Staffordshire was finally persuaded to allow metal detectorists onto his land. We'd had several requests in the past for people to come metal detecting, and until the motorway was announced, we never allowed anyone on. And, and then a, a chap running a club approached me, and he said, um, you may as well let someone on now, because if, if there's anything there, and the motorway takes it, it'll be lost forever. And he got a good point. Anyway, I think eight of them came at the weekend and went all over the whole farm. And they only found buttons and buckles, what I thought was rubbish. And then um, Terry approached me. And I told him no several times. Basically because I didn't particularly like him. Anyway, he, he, he come and asked me if he could come on this field specifically and I thought, well, he can't come to any harm down there and he won't find anything. Fred couldn't have been more wrong. Metal detectorist Terry Herbert not only struck gold, he made the find of a lifetime. I was working in the yard and he came up for mid-morning and he said, sit down, I said, what's the matter with you? Sit down, he said. I said, what's the matter? He said, I found a Saxon hoard. Well, I didn't, I didn't believe him. It wasn't until uh, the archaeologists came on and I came and had a look myself that I realised what he'd found. When the experts arrived, the true extent of the hoard started to become clear. This was a find unlike anything they'd seen before. I was not really believing it because he'd sort of seen the odd piece like this in some of the uh, some of the books but uh, to have row upon row these things is just quite incredible so uh, I, th I think my first thought was very much you know how lucky the detector they must have been to have found all this and there couldn't possibly be anything left to find so we got to the site and uh, w within seconds there was this large oval gold piece with garnets and it just sat there on the surface and we thought gosh this is real isn't it and almost Within seconds of breaking the ground, there's piece after piece was coming up. So uh, we got quite quite hectic just from right from the from from the dot. You never really ever get involved in finds with sort of precious metals. This is real sort of Indiana Jones type stuff. The largest hoard of Anglo-Saxon gold and silver ever discovered in Britain has officially been declared as treasure. It may have seemed like the stuff movies were made of, but this treasure trove of gold and silver was very real. It was a fabulous find that would make Terry a wealthy man, as he revealed in a rare interview at the time. It came quite as a shock actually, but when the archaeologist was on the, on the field, the one told me, he, he came up to me and he said, uh, it's the end of this, this is you'll end up being a millionaire. And that happened, didn't it? Yes, yes. How much did you get all together? £1,642,500. Fred also got his share of the find, but despite his sudden wealth, he's carried on farming his land near Litchfield. It's thought he may have brought the treasure nearer the surface when he had problems with his plough that year, but he's still not claiming any of the credit. I feel very lucky. I think it's more luck than judgement that I actually ended up owning it, you know. You know <clears throat> people have asked me if I feel proud, but I don't think pride's the right thing. You can be proud of something you've done or something you've made, something you've achieved. But I think this is pure luck. It is a multi-million pound discovery. But for historians, the hoard's real worth lies in what it can possibly tell us about our distant past. We now have thousands more clues into Anglo-Saxon times. Pommels from the top of swords, pieces of warrior helmet, strange serpents and mangled crosses, a boy's own collection of warrior bling, and it captured the imagination of the world. 
So you think that old metal detector, even an old banged up one, no good use anymore? Good evening, welcome to the BBC News at six. It's the biggest haul of Anglo-Saxon gold and silver ever found. It comprises more than it's, it's, I never ever in my Please career thought I would be holding this kind of treasure. It's, um, it's the sort of thing you, you dream of. I think the fact we made the lead item on the six o'clock news so it was a big hint that maybe things were going to be big. It is the earth yielding up its treasure. It literally came from the soil of Staffordshire. It was deliberately put there. It was removed from it 1,500 years later. But it needs to keep those roots. It's very big. It's 1,500 objects, and it's 11 pounds of gold, and God knows how much more silver. So it's a huge find. And I think... If one were to do simpler arithmetic, this is a multiple of several times everything else that we've got from Anglo-Saxon England. It wasn't just the press whose appetite was insatiable. The public were also desperate to find out all they could about this incredible hoard. I just think it's outstanding, and the quality of the work and the quantity as well. This is, I guess, only a small amount of it, but uh, very impressed. It's absolutely fantastic. It hasn't disappointed one little bit. It's been brilliant. I'm a jeweller, so uh, it's uh, quite a thrill to have a look at it, to be honest. At its peak, people were waiting four hours to come in and see the hoard. To get 42,000 people through one gallery in, in a 19-day period is, is un, unequalled here. I mean, astonishing. I mean, it was our experience of the blockbuster. And, and it was wonderful. The hoard was huge, packed with beautifully crafted artefacts. But what does it actually tell us? Can one lucky find really change our thinking about Anglo-Saxon England? Well, before the hoard was found, we already had some idea about what life was like in this period. There really haven't been that many large Anglo-Saxon finds made in Britain. And perhaps the biggest and best known before the hoard was here at this incredible set of burial mounds at Sutton Hoo in Suffolk. In the 1930s, an archaeologist from the local museum excavated this mound here, and in it, he made a series of incredible finds. Finds that gave us a stunning insight into a world that had previously only existed in legend. The last remotely comparable find, I mean, normally you find a couple of brooches and this kind of thing, if you're lucky, the odd ring where you actually discovered the royal ring of an Anglo-Saxon king, which is pretty amazing. Um, but this is the only thing that's comparable to it, is the great discovery in the 1930s um, called the Sutton Hoo Ship, uh, which is in East Anglia. The um, uh, Sutton Hoo Ship is a deliberate burial. It's a wonderful ceremonial burial. What they did, it must be a king. We think it's Redwald, uh, the king of the East Anglians, and they drag this great long boat up from the river. They lay the king's body there, and they surround it with these incomparable treasures, and they dress it. So he's got his great helmet on, he's got his massive sword by his side. Sutton, who is a deliberate creation, it's a grand ceremonial funeral. It's like something out of one of the sagas, except usually in the sagas, for example, the death of Beowulf, they deliberately destroy, they, it's a funeral pyre, the thing is consumed with fire. This was a burial, so it's preserved. So that really is the English tomb of Tutankhamun. In Sutton Hoo, we really have an idealised sense of um, the hall in miniature for the afterlife. So the king, if, if we can say it's a king, the deceased has been buried with everything they would need for the afterlife. And what we get is a real glimpse of the life of the hall in Anglo-Saxon times. So we have drinking horns, we have cauldrons, we have everything they would need a, a lyre to play music on. It's like opening a window onto the time in terms of looking at it as um, this, this vibrant hall life, this, this, this kingly or noble life of the hall. Sutton Hoo may have been a significant find, but such windows into the past have been few and far between. For much of their understanding of this era, scholars have had to rely on historical texts. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, originally compiled under the orders of King Alfred the Great of Wessex, gives us one account of this time. A further picture is painted by a man who may have been this country's earliest historian. 
Bede um, writing in the late 720s, the early 730s, was the first to give shape uh, to English history. I mean, he, one has to imagine that he is writing in a, in a, in a vacuum. He has to, he, he in, in effect is the first person who determines the narrative of, of English history in uh, this very early period. And um, so his contribution was, was absolutely staggering. Um, and he, he articulates um, the, the whole of that period. He, he characterizes the different, he identifies and characterizes the different kingdoms. We see how they interacted with each other. We see what made them tick. We, 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 we see all of these things for the first time in any kind of um, detail from Bede's ecclesiastical history. So it's, it's the most um, extraordinary source. But it has, but it, it sees everything from a Northumbrian perspective, and uh, we would dearly like to have other views of that period written from other parts of the country. Although there's debate about the balance and accuracy of these texts, they are two of the most valuable sources we have for the Anglo-Saxon period. But we also have one of England's most important poems, written in Old English somewhere between the 9th and 11th century. Beowulf tells of a warrior hero who set out to destroy a man-eating monster called Grendel, in a story which captures many of the beliefs and attitudes of the time. Glittering gold spread on the ground, the old dawn-scorching serpent's den packed with goblins. So, rich literary sources like Beowulf, Bede and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, along with wonderful, if rare, finds like Sutton Hoo, have given us an intriguing insight into life during the Dark Ages. But there is one particular gap in our knowledge of these times. A lack of literary finds from the biggest Anglo-Saxon kingdom of all, Mercia. In Mercia is fascinating because, I mean, we... We don't have much in the way of documentary references to Mercia because what we have, we have the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle which is really bigging up Wessex. It's all about how wonderful Alfred was and how wonderful Wessex was. And we have Bede, the Venerable Bede, who has an agenda to say how wonderful Northumbria was. We don't have an equivalent for Mercia. What everybody said was the Mercians were a, a violent, rapacious lot who went around hunting, shooting, killing people. They didn't get a chance to tell their side of the story. But that's where the Horde could help. It was discovered at the centre of what used to be this huge kingdom, and it could give us more clues about how these mysterious Mercians used to live. So what can it tell us? I've come to Tamworth, northeast of Birmingham, a few miles from where the Horde was found. We know that in the middle of the 7th century, which is about when the Horde was buried, Tamworth was at the very heart of Mercian royal power. The mighty Mercian kings would fight their enemies, beating off invasion or trying to expand their empire, and then they'd return here to Tamworth to sign treaties and charters, and of course reward their loyal followers and warriors with gold. And today, Tamworth Castle stares down at what was the heart of this royal estate. Even before the Horde was found, historians thought they had a pretty good idea of the importance of Tamworth and the kind of people who used to live there. The royal court wasn't a group of delicate people all wearing silk and satin and posing. It was a warrior band. The, the warrior elite surrounding the king lived and died with him. If he succeeded, they got pots of gold, pots of land, pots of women, lots and lots of nice horses, and life was great. Um, if the king failed, they died horribly. Yeah, well actually, if we come out um, up onto the tower, you get a fantastic sense of, oh, the, wow. of the setting of, of, of Tamworth and why it was such a special place, why it was so important. Um, That's gorgeous, isn't it, it? It is stunning, isn't it? Yeah. And you can see the castle's a very strategic spot. We're looking out all that would sort of dominate all this ground here, don't we? And of course the river crossing there. Marion Blockley is an archaeologist and an expert in Anglo-Saxon history. 
For her, the hoard is further proof of the wealth and power of Tamworth. So this is a, a major British yeah. royal settlement. I mean, Absolutely. it's as important as anywhere else in the, in the whole of the modern UK. Definitely. I mean, I worked in Canterbury, I worked in York and many other places. And, and I have this feeling, poor Tamworth, it, it tends to feel neglected, but actually it was exceptionally significant. More um, charters were signed here at important times of the year, at Christmas, at Easter. The royal court travelled around and Tamworth was the place they wanted to be. The hoard was discovered not far from where we're standing. Marion likes to imagine it could be proof of a battle with Welsh warriors in the 7th century Midlands, recorded in a later poem. How any ideas how it might have got there? Nearby, two miles away, was a battle, a famous battle, um, where two kings, Morvile and Cancla, were involved in a battle with the Britons. And it's possible, as they fled, that they may have um, taken the hoard with them and buried it, hoping to come back. Sadly, they were killed. The story goes that Candillan of Powys allied himself to a ruler called Morville. Together they launched a terrifying raid against a settlement called Kirluikoit, which some people think is today's Lichfield. The Allies were ruthless. The fighting was fierce and bloody. Many were killed. As was the practice at the time. They ransacked the town and they left with the spoils of war and the booty they'd captured. The battle was recorded in around the 9th century in a lament for one of the Welsh leaders. Before Luitcoit they triumphed. There was blood beneath the ravens and fierce attack. Glory in battle, great plunder. Before Kayak Luitcoit, more vile took it. That's really rather wonderful, isn't it? To think that actually might be something to yeah. the hoard is very exciting. Isn't that it? is quite exciting. I mean, I'm not saying it's true, but, you know, it may well be. This could be a rare, teasing moment of clarity in a very murky history. The trouble is that this poem was written around 200 years later than we can date anything in the hoard. And battles like this weren't exactly unusual. Turf wars were an everyday feature of Anglo-Saxon life. We can understand it now, I think, better than it's ever been possible since because we have gangland culture back in Britain. It's gang warfare. And you know, what happens is when you take over the territory of a rival gang, the lot get bumped off, usually in extraordinarily unpleasant ways. A close examination of the Horde throws up more questions than answers. There are definitely bits of weaponry which perhaps belong to high-status warriors, but there are also an extraordinary number of them, especially the ornate pommels. And, and so these are, these are pommels for the, for the top of the sword, are they? That's right, they're, they're highly decorative. I mean, the stunning thing is that there are more than 90 of these in this hoard. I mean, I couldn't believe it. You know, I've spent 30 years digging Anglo-Saxon sites, finding one or two of these objects. And to see some, literally my jaw dropped. This quantity of swords is quite remarkable. One possible explanation is that the hoard was part of a king's collection. It may have been on its way to the palace here at Tamworth when it was somehow intercepted. Tamworth was a royal treasury. At that time, kings used to receive gifts um, of Heriot, something known as Heriot, that warriors, elder men, the important sort of middle class people of the, of the uh, society at that stage, would actually bequeath their most significant items of weaponry, their best swords, um, their best helmet, to the king. And often the king would then distribute high quality swords back to their favoured warriors. So it, it sort of gives us a context for this group of objects. It's possible it's possible, I mean, there's so many interpretations, but it is possible that this group of objects, which are mainly weapons, with, with the exception of a few crosses, were actually acquired by a king. They were given to that king over a long, long period of time, and that king then redistributed them to his, his most favoured warriors. Or someone sort of pulled a heist against the king and... Uh, and ran off with it, it. yeah. I it. mean, that's the, that's the intriguing thing, because it's bent. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways we can interpret the fact that it's been bent. To some, the way the hoard is broken and twisted suggests it could record the very moment when it was taken, perhaps as spoils from a bloody battle. You look at it, you look at that cross, 
Um, you can see exactly what it once was. You can see the moment it was crumpled. You can practically see how the hands tore it off. Again, I think it's a pommel uh, where you could actually see how it had been sort of gemmed off. There's that moment of action. It's frozen forever. The hoard also offers proof of the wealth of sections of this society. This piece isn't actually from a sword. It's a sort of guard where you'd have a, a single-sided stabbing knife called a CX. Oh, I see. So, but it's the, almost this piece here. It, exactly, it? Oh, yes. Okay. It's the equivalent to this piece here, but it would have been from a, a single-sided... But that's solid gold. It's solid gold. I mean, I mean just, yeah. The owner of that must have been... Yeah. I mean, amongst the most rich and powerful men in the kingdom, surely. Yeah. And if you look, I mean, it's exquisite detail. of The light catching it, these gripping birds. I mean, it, it is unbelievably beautiful. The guys who... Um, wore and carried these, these items of, of decorative jewellery were, um, it's been, they were described as the strutting peacocks. They were, this was their sort of show armour. Very little of this stuff shows any evidence of being, you know, hacked about in battle. This was the stuff you wore on the parade ground. In examining the hoard, we come across another mystery. We have a really interesting um, problem, I think, with the Staffordshire Horde, in that you have all the attachments to weapons, but uh, uh, that there aren't these, these sword blades. And you know, we read in the, in the literature about how finely wrought these things were. You know, from examples at, at Sutton Hoo, you can see that these things were incredibly complicated to make, the actual blades of swords, and were very, very prized. So why weren't they deposited in this hoard? What we may have here is that these elements of decoration are the sort of personalisation of a sword, that the blade will be passed from one warrior to another. Their sword was their battle friend. They gave names to their sword. We all know about Excalibur. My favourite sword, Excalibur. Well, these swords were symbolic of the power of a great warrior. Absolutely exquisite. It's a work of art on a weapon for killing people. Mm. Quite incredible, really. Yes. One of the country's leading Anglo-Saxon experts from the University of Cambridge believes that looking at where the hoard was found, beside an ancient road close to Tamworth, may help us to understand what it actually is. To my mind as a historian, the most remarkable thing about the Staffordshire hoard is the location of the find. The hoard was found on the side of the Roman road known as Watling Street, now known as the A5, and uh, that is very close to some of the other known uh, recorded centres of mercy and power. Tamworth is, is very close by Lichfield, where the bishopric of the Mercians was established. That also is very, very close. So um, it's found in the heartland of the Kingdom of the Mercians, but equally it's found on the side of Watling Street which is the major road leading from the heart of the Kingdom of the Mercians down into London and onwards. The fact that the Horde is sitting there on Watling Street means, in effect, that it could have come from the south, it could have come from East Anglia, it could have come from almost any other part of, of, of Britain. Um, so one has then to look at the material itself and to see whether um, archaeologists and experts in 7th century metalwork and, and art history are able to say more about the associations uh, of the material once it has all been properly cleaned, um, studied, uh, related to other surviving objects and so on. What it would be nice to know is more about the, the circumstances by which the hoard got there. You know, is it some kind of ritual deposition? Is it somebody in a panic hiding it who never comes back for it? Um, if you knew that, you would then have a better sense of the significance of the road in that. The landscape where the hoard was found could explain why it was buried here. For decades, modern traffic has passed by the site on what's now known as the A5, but which then was an important route between London and the Midlands. In the Anglo-Saxon times, this area would have been totally remote and almost silent, quite unlike today with the Watling Street blasting past. The Watling Street was there in Anglo-Saxon times, but the rest of the area was uh, 
wood pasture. It was woodland and heathland, open woodland, because it was used probably early on as summer pasture by estates way to the west and to the east. This area too was on a boundary, but not an exact boundary, but over to the west was the Penkaseata tribe and to the east the Tom Theatre, two folk regions in Mercia. Dr Della Hook is a landscape specialist and she's come up with three major theories as to how and why the Staffordshire Horde came to be buried in this Midlands field close to Watling Street. There are various suggestions that one could make about the Horde. Firstly, the village over there is Hammerwich and the name means the Hammer place, the Hammer settlement, which suggests metalworking. But on the other hand, there's nothing else been found in Hammerwich Parish to suggest metalworking on a great scale. Um, just one little pendant. Um, but the hoard was strange because it was mostly gold. So the second suggestion is that it was deliberately placed, even below a barrow, but there was no body, um, as a sort of votive offering in a way, when somebody died. You, were, you had to get rid in Anglo-Saxon times when gold was imbued with magic because ill-gotten gains had to be buried. And it's just possible that it was buried there on this sort of frontier location between the two folk groups uh, as a, a magical ritual like the one in Beowulf where the gold that Beowulf had taken was buried on his death. The final scenario which may perhaps be nearer to the truth isn't quite so exciting but it could just have been pushed into a hole near a hillock which could be recognised again by someone fleeing along the Watling Street. Remember it was all a very small collection in one bag. It would have been a heavy bag too. And if someone was chasing them or they had stolen it from somewhere, somebody's trophy collection, they could have put it down there and just never been in a position to retrieve it. Because it's very close on this hill to the Watling Street. Some of these items have come from Northumbria, some of them have come from Kent, some have probably come from Scandinavia. So, so that's an interesting element. Were they looted as a result of battles by the Mercians? Were they given to the Mercian king as tribute by his sub-peoples? And we found them dismembered and bent. Now, were they crammed into a box to be taken away? and where they were located, right beside Watling Street. The location is very prominent, but, but also hidden. And was somebody trying to escape from a battle? Were they trying to come away from the Royal Treasury at, at Tamworth? Or were they coming perhaps from the, the settlement at Wall? It looks most like uh, as if it's some kind of treasure uh, that has been recovered from uh, a battle field. It, it, um, I think the most telling thing to, to my mind about it quite a, is not so much the sheer quantity as the, the folded cross, um, those other gold objects which, which um, speak volumes, I think, for the context uh, from which it came. The Staffordshire Horde may also have something to teach us about trade. Those sparkling garnets which were discovered in their thousands in a muddy field were the jewel of choice for Anglo-Saxon warriors. But where did they originally come from? Access to the sea allowed them to trade and bring in luxury goods from far afield. Bronze bowls from Egypt, lapis lazuli from a single mine in Afghanistan, and amethyst pendants from India all found their way to these shores. The Lindisfarne Gospels, these richly decorated Christian manuscripts drawn on the island of Lindisfarne further up the east coast in the late 7th or early 8th centuries, use a colour red that can only be extracted from certain insects living in trees next to the Mediterranean. These garnets probably came from uh, India or Sri Lanka. And we can do research on the, I mean, the fascinating, it's very likely that very early on in the period, large garnets came from India and Sri Lanka. Later on, when the trade routes broke down, they had smaller garnets, which are coming from places like Portugal and Bohemia. So you're looking at um, a remarkable um, international trade in this stuff. Globalisation. Globalisation. Yeah. Until the sort of end of the mid, mid to late 7th century, you don't have any um, formal 
trading sites, but they do start to emerge in this period. So um, the sites at London and Southampton and Ipswich, they're engaged in very, very extensive trade networks with Northern Europe and down into the Frankish kingdoms as well. Um, throughout the 5th and 6th centuries, Western Britain was engaged in trade um, down the Atlantic coast routes as well. So, you know, people conceptualise this, this period as a dark ages, but actually that's that's really not fair. You know, it's a, it's a society that is thoroughly engaged in all kinds of networks and contacts. Um, you know, life keeps going and it keeps going at a fairly, fairly good level. Desire for wealth and riches led to battles. And around the time when the Horde may have been hidden, Mercia had its sights set on expansion. It had become one of the most feared kingdoms of all. Mercian kings at this moment were the winners. And so you see little kingdoms to the west, bigger kingdoms to the east are sucked and absorbed. First of all, you roll Northumbria back, then you take over uh, uh, lands towards Wales and, the, and the, the Welsh marches. Then, of course, the Mercians absorb Kent, they absorb London, they swing over into East Anglia. So you're creating this huge middle kingdom. It's a period of unbelievable turmoil, political and religious. It's when England, remember, that isn't England at all. England has yet to be invented. The word barely exists. Instead, there are these rival, warring Anglo-Saxon kingdoms that behave like the first, the worst kind of takeover bidders in the city. They sort of decapitate each other. Literally, it has to be said, not metaphorically. They aggregate, they come together, they take over, they destroy. And kingdom after kingdom is swallowed up. By the um, 8th, 9th century, Mercia is certainly the largest kingdom geographically. It covers the largest portion of, of the British Isles in that respect. So what can the Horde tell us about the people who carved out the Kingdom of Mercia? We have very few records, and those we do have are written by outsiders. We know precious little about uh, the Kingdom of the Mercians. We, we, we know the major figures. We know that there was a, a figure in the first half of the 7th century called Penda, uh, who emerges quite clearly in the pages of Bede's ecclesiastical history, mainly as a fairly aggressive uh, figure, someone who was um, active against the Northumbrians, who was also active uh, in the East, and in particular against the East Angles. And so we get uh, the sense of Mercia as effectively a, a, um, a predatory power. They're, they're, they're out to, to um, expand, perhaps, but most of all, probably to, to raid, to, to, to uh, acquire treasure, to acquire resources that they don't have in their own uh, part of the country. What many would like to believe is that the Horde could have belonged to one of the last great pagan kings, Penda, a man with a formidable reputation who went on to father a line of famous Mercian leaders. He held on to the old religion at a time when many around him were turning to Christianity. The timing might well be right. Penda was a mighty overlord who ruled Mercia during its early rise to power. Even by the standards of the time, he was particularly ruthless. He deposed one king, he killed two others, and he dealt with one in a particularly grisly way. Legend has it that after he defeated Oswald, king of Northumbria, at the Battle of Maserfield, he had his disembodied arms and head stuck on stakes in the ground. We all want him to be Penda, uh, who is the famous king of Mercia. Penda is the king in the early 7th century uh, of Mercia and he's fighting a huge program of expansion against Northumbria which had adopted Christianity quite early and to begin with he's immensely successful. He defeats and peculiarly unpleasantly uh, disposes of it, presumably in ritual sacrifice, to uh, Northumbrian kings and it would be lovely if this really is the monument of one of those battles. Penda really doesn't get the recognition that he deserves in the texts because most of the history at this point is written down by the Venerable Bede. He's a Northumbrian and a Christian and therefore an enemy of this pagan Mercian king, the last of the pagan Mercian kings. 
Bede hates Penda because he defeats and does horrible things to Northumbrian kings. And, there's, 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 and also, of course, he's the wrong side. He's a pagan. Um, and Bede is a very great historian, but great historians are not impartial. Bede is writing for a purpose. The Horde has yet to give us any direct evidence of Penda. But that's not to say the two aren't linked. Penda was the one king who held out while everyone around him was converting to Christianity. In 655, when he died, fighting against his enemies, Christianity consumed this final kingdom. The conversion of Mercia, England's last great pagan kingdom, marked the beginning of a new era in English history. And the Staffordshire Horde has helped to shine a light on exactly how and when this transformation occurred. One of the most intriguing finds in the hoard was a piece of gold with an inscription from the Bible that may help us date a crucial turning point in our history. The conversion to Christianity changed the whole fabric of our society, bringing with it the written word and the rule of law. But despite its importance to British history, no one knows exactly how or when it came about. Lichfield has been an important religious centre since the early Christian days of Mercia. And this book is the earliest documentary evidence of the religion in the Midlands. This is uh, the cathedral's greatest treasure and we call it the St Chad Gospels. Um, we think it was uh, almost certainly created to adorn uh, Chad's um, shrine. Uh, so Chad died in 672. So this book has been associated with this building for 1300 years? Something like 1300 years. The Gospel and the Horde date from around the same time, a crucial turning point in the religious history of Britain, and in the Horde are a mixture of pagan and Christian symbols. So were the Mercians who owned the Horde Christian converts, or the last of the pagans? Or could the crumpled crosses and Latin inscriptions be the looted possessions of another defeated Christian enemy? My hunch is that the Horde items gives us the last glimpse of pagan Mercia and a gospel book like this, the first glimpse of Christian Mercia. Do you know, looking at some of the symmetrical patterns and the floral patterns, some of the inlay on, on the Horde goods is actually not totally dissimilar. It's absolutely looks... part of the same cultural mm. family, the kind, of, uh, the kind of interlacing and also the zoomorphic um, uh, uh, creatures um, in, the, in the decoration, very reminiscent of yeah. some of the Horde items. Yeah, there's lots of animals depicted in the Horde and they're on, on here as well, just beautiful. We know that it was not um, uncommon for, uh, for monks and, and, and bishops um, to, to, to be on the battlefield, not necessarily as, as combatants, more, more likely mostly as non-combatants, um, but, but, but bringing with them, as it were, um, the power in which their army believed. And this is interesting because this is a, a quote on here um, which actually refers to uh, sort of military activity. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a Latin um, text uh, from the Bible, um, from the book of Numbers, chapter 10, verse 35. Um, and the translation of the text is, Arise, O God, and let your enemies be scattered. Let those who hate you flee before you. And you can quite see why um, a kingdom... Uh, a Christian kingdom going into battle, uh, particularly against a pagan neighbour, uh, might want to inscribe exactly that text onto a cross that was being uh, perhaps um, led uh, to, to, to lead the, uh, uh, the, the Christian warriors into battle. It's a very personal piece, isn't it? You can imagine someone clutching it. Yes, you can, you can, you can. You so really they go can. into battle. Yeah. And the fact that it ends up in a hole in the middle of mercy, it means that perhaps the owner Perhaps the owner didn't have the God on his side Absolutely, that day. Absolutely, yeah, you've got to feel that, um, that, uh, that the, the owner of that was on the losing side that day. Yeah. Here the Horde throws up more questions than it answers. This was a religious turning point, but whose? And rather than being the last pagans in a largely Christian world, were the Mercians actually a bit of both, subscribing to two religions at the same time, just to make sure? I think Definitely, we find in a number of Anglo-Saxon objects this idea of hedging your bets, that we are talking about a transitional moment, a spiritual transitional moment, but also a cultural transitional moment. So you have the protective talisman of the processional cross, um, that, that idea of carrying Christ into battle, being protected by him. And then you have these talismans, these, these serpents, 
these traditional Anglo-Saxon battle beasts. It's no peace-loving text, this isn't, you know, love thy neighbour, turn the other cheek, thou shalt not kill. It's none of that. It is surge domine, rise up, O Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let those who hate thee be driven from thy face. This is the church militant, the church warlike. Of course, Christianity adapting itself to context. If you try and plant Christianity in a warrior culture, it's got to assume the elements of a warrior culture. So here you have warlike pagans fighting warlike Christians. We shouldn't underestimate just how important the Horde is when it comes to telling the story of Britain's conversion to Christianity. It's a story which was also sketched out in the Peak District by an amateur enthusiast in the 1800s. Before the Horde was dug up, probably the most important Anglo-Saxon find ever made within the old Kingdom of Mercia was made by this man here, Thomas Bateman, whose tomb today sits surrounded by his beloved Peak District landscape. Now in the Victorian period, this man was known as the Barrow Knight, and he dug up around 200, some say even more, barrows or burial mounds. And the site of his most important discovery is just a few miles that way. The Anglo-Saxons often reused prehistoric barrows to bury their most important dead. And it was in a grave that probably belonged to an earl or prince that Bateman uncovered one of the few helmets ever to be discovered, opening a new chapter in the military history of a warlike people. This replica of the helmet is in a Sheffield museum, along with the original finds, which archaeologists now believe come from the same period as the Staffordshire Horde, and show a country on the cusp of moving from paganism to Christianity. Well, this is it. This is where it was found. Actually, you can see the, yep. the round sort of ditch and Absolutely. an arrangement in the middle. Yeah. Absolutely. He find, found the remains of a helmet, which had a, a boar on the crest and a silver cross set into the, the, the nose piece. Remains of a, a leather cup, which had two silver crosses uh, on that. Um, some, some iron chain um, and some discs that were from uh, a large a bronze hanging bowl, which would have been used for some ritual purpose, whether it would be for drinking or hand washing, we're, we're, we're not sure. And do you think that all signifies that this was a man of some, some stature? Oh yeah, this is, we, we call this a princely burial. This is someone of, of, of really high status in this region. I mean, how important is what was found here? Well, when it was found in the middle of the 19th century, it was incredibly important because it gave us really our first insight into the, the Anglo-Saxons and Germanic culture uh, in, the, uh, in the Peak District. And it showed us the, the ways in which the, the Mercian kingdoms were expanded into this um, region. I don't think at the time the, the, the find was as widely publicised as it might have been and it sort of disappeared into a, a provincial uh, museum where it perhaps hasn't attracted the attention that it, that, that it should have had. But it still retains incredible importance even in the light of the discovery of the hoard. What do you think? It's interesting the little clues, the boar and the cross, I mean, what do you think they signify? Well, primarily the boar signals uh, strength, courage, aggression. I mean, these are the kinds of images that a warrior would want to portray. Uh, themselves as possessing in the in the seventh century, uh, the cross is obviously self-evidently a Christian uh, symbol. I don't think it's a case of hedging your bets between paganism and Christianity. I think it's a perfectly appropriate way for a Christian seventh-century Anglo-Saxon prince to to project his image with. And besides, conversion wasn't necessarily a permanent thing in Anglo-Saxon England. It's sort of, it's almost like an ebbing tide, you know, it, it comes into an area and then it might go away again. In the 7th century, conversion was very much a political act. So it, it, if you were trying to convert an area, you went straight to the top, you went to the king, you tried to get the king to convert. So that's what you see in Kent and in East Anglia. And sometimes it would suit those kings to convert, and so they would, but then 20 years down the line, it didn't suit them anymore and so they would revert. So you do see some of these areas flip-flopping between Christianity and paganism. Um, and it's not really until the end of the 7th century that most areas of the country are consistently Christian. So whoever buried the Horde has left us with a snapshot of a moment in time when England changed forever. But what other secrets might it still hold? The painstaking process of cleaning, examining and testing the hoard will continue for decades as archaeologists and scientists try to turn speculation into facts.
There's still an awful lot of analysis to do. You know, you can do lots and lots of technical analysis, you can analyse the composition of the gold and the garnets, and you might be able to get some dating evidence out of that. You can do much more with the inscriptions, you know, looking for parallels for those, and actually just analysing the composition of the hoard itself. We don't quite know what that hoard represents. You know, we don't know whether it's the aftermath of a battle, we don't know whether it's, um, you know, a king's treasury that's been... Um, taken captive on the road and buried in secret. So we don't know why it got there. We don't know when it got there. You know, it, it might tell us something very different if we know it was buried in 650 compared to if we knew it was buried in 750. So, you know, that dating of it is really going to be quite key in terms of understanding its significance. Kevin Leahy, the National Finds Advisor from the Portable Antiquities Scheme, has been responsible for cataloguing the hoard. What an extraordinary collection, but the other thing is they're very diverse. I mean, there's all sorts of different objects. Some of them, I don't even know what they are. I must admit, neither do we in some cases. This is part of the great, great fun. We've moved into new grounds on this material, things that we've not seen before. We've, we always find that it's not the object you identify straight away that's going to give us the story. It's the things that we don't know what they are. There's this piece over here which is truly remarkable, beautifully decorated with garnets on three faces. And that's a groove there, perhaps something would have gone in that groove. Yeah, yeah, yes, I mean, I, I've speculated that it's the edging from a book. So that's why this could be all sort of bent and shattered. Someone just ripped apart this jewelled book cover and it became someone's swag. Y y yes, it's, it's, it's been t torn off the cover, though while a lot of the material it, is bent and broken. There's been no systematic attempt to trash it. Row upon row of amazing artefacts give us a new understanding of the ways in which our ancestors lived. I particularly like uh, this material because of the strange scenes shown on it. They're made out of silver foil. It's a technique that we call pressblech, a German word for want of a better name in, in English. Um, they show scenes of processions of warriors. You see the round oh, shields see, yeah. and the spears. Um, th these probably came from a helmet. They were used in, in panels along the sides of a helmet. We get that at Sutton Who. Amazing going into battle with these extraordinary images on the side of your helmet. It's incredible. And then there's this lovely thing. This hung at the side of an Anglo-Saxon warrior who must have habitually rested his left hand on his sword. And look at the polish on the top of that, where the man's hand was resting on his most treasured possession, the, the hilt of his sword. This all meant something to someone. It's not art for art's sake. There are stories and things in here. What the Horde has laid bare here is the existence of a rich ruling class. These weren't ignorant savages. They were people with incredible wealth and skill who prized great beauty. They would spend a lot of time in the company of their weaponry and so meditating and ruminating on the imagery and how the piece works and how one beast begins and another ends, that's part of the beauty of them for their original audience as well. The thing that strikes you as you look at them I think is twofold, apart from the engineering. It's, first of all, the amazing linear sense. It's like Art Deco. Either Art Deco or perhaps Art Nouveau. These wonderful, sinuous, curling, animal, tree, plant, particularly animal, uh, fighting, fighting lions, fish entwined. They love serpents, warlike serpents, chewing each other, winding themselves round each other's tails. Um, so there's this immensely powerful linear sense. And you also have a craftsmanship in terms of the matching of gold and jewels, which I think you've got to get to Fabergé before you've anything as good. I suppose the plain truth is, isn't it really, that uh, uh, the, after all the Anglo-Saxons are German. So this is the origin, it's a kind of BMW style engineering, um, which we unfortunately have grown out of, but they still had. <laughs> it's amazing, under the microscope, it just you see even more detail, don't you? It's absolutely incredible. We're now seeing this in, in greater detail than the person who owned it ever saw it. it it's phenomenal. You've got, carefully cut garnets 
uh, laid into intricate cells, each stone carefully shaped. And garnet's a tricky material to work. It's not a particularly rare stone, but it can't be, it can't be just sheared off like a slate. If you want thin garnets, you've got to cut them thin. And then and they're, they're millimetre perfect, aren't they? Into these, they've all got to be cut into these special shapes, uh, and they've, they've all got to be absolutely perfect. Modern day jewellers say that we would need four times magnification to do the detailed work seen on the hoard. There's the animal's head, the two little ring like eyes. You have to pinch yourself to remind yourself how small it is. I mean, how did they cut these shapes to fit so perfectly within the, within the gold? It's incredibly intricate, this piece here. It's mind-blowing. The, the, the more you look at it, the more incredibly it comes. That pattern of cells fitted together. Even more startling, under each garnet, you've got a small piece of waffle-patterned gold foil. Really? It's to scatter the light back so that it glitters, just like the reflectors on a motor car. That's, it, that's what we're seeing here. Yes. When you get the measurements up on the screen, it shows just how, I mean, it's just how small that is. I mean, each one of those is 0 0.03 of a millimetre across. It, it, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, something like this could have been worn by royalty itself. I mean, Penda, the great Mercian king, for example, it could, it could easily have been attached to him or his family, I guess. Yes, or, or, or one of the, the people that he, he sent into the next world. It, this, this is material that belonged to the losers, not the winners, and this could have been taken from uh, Oswald of Northumbria or Edwin of Northumbria or Sigebert of Kent. We, we, we don't know. It's, it's dangerous to try and attach names to material like this, but it's great fun. The discovery of warrior treasure has put a splash of colour into our black and white view of 1400 years ago. The traditional view is that life in the Dark Ages was nasty, brutish and short. And it's this idea that everyone lived in huts and um, hovels and really didn't have much quality of life. And so that's why we get this term Dark Age associated with it. But that's so far from the truth. As I've travelled across the old kingdom of Mercia, it's become clear to me just how important the discovery of the Horde really has been. It shone a light into the Midlands of the Dark Ages, revealing a powerful, wealthy and sophisticated people who were a force to be reckoned with in the Anglo-Saxon world. England, remember, isn't England at all. England has yet to be invented. Instead, there are these rival, warring Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. They sort of decapitate each other, literally it has to be said, not metaphorically. They aggregate, they come together, they take over, they destroy. And Kingdom after kingdom is swallowed up. In an amazing stroke of luck, it's also captured a moment, a turning point in our history, when Britain became a Christian land. My hunch is that the Horde items gives us the last glimpse of pagan Mercia and a gospel book like this, the first glimpse of Christian Mercia. As we found, the discovery also raises as many fresh questions. Questions that scientists and historians will spend years trying to answer. The Horde will have many more surprises for us, and it may yet force us to reevaluate everything we think we know. <laughs>